Um, I want to start with uh, just one thing, and that is this. I don't know if you can see this here. We, we, the studio audience received a very nice card here, and you can see it has Spider-Man and some of the villains that he fights. And so the studio audience was very happy to receive this card from some friends of ours out in the internet space. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that, and I wanted to acknowledge sort of all the kind thoughts and cards and wishes and kind comments that people post on Facebook or YouTube or email or otherwise. We appreciate all the kind words. Some of the stuff that is posted is not so kind, uh, so I guess we thank you for the candor, I suppose. Um, but we, we seem to like this stuff that's kind a lot better, just if I'm being honest with you. Most is kind, I'm told. Um, so I look at me in 2 Timothy 2 before we jump in. I wanted to share one thing with you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And uh, I'm going to share these verses with you because I think there's an opportunity here for you that I'm going to share with you, and that's this. Uh, when you look at Facebook, when you look at YouTube, there's a lot of comments on there. We don't have time to respond to all of them, um, so we just can't. But uh, you may be on there and you may see them. And so my encouragement to you is if you're so inclined to respond to them in a way that is gracious and helpful. Look with me at 2 Timothy 2 verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. We shouldn't be about strivings, but be gentle. That's what we need to be. A lot of people are keyboard warriors. They sit at their little computer in the mom's basement and they fire off nasty grams and they just are unpleasant and harsh and judgmental and so on. And they wouldn't talk to people like that face to face, but that's how they behave when they're at home in front of their keyboard. Well, Scripture tells us what are we supposed to be, but be gentle unto all men. So whether you're online or otherwise, the way you want to interact with people is you want to be gentle. Then notice what it says, apt to teach, patient. So if you're going to be a servant of the Lord, if you're going to do the Lord's work, what do you need to be? You need to be apt to teach. You need to be willing and, and ready and able and enthusiastic about teaching. Patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now, the idea there is that people that are in false doctrine, they're deceived. They've been taken captive by the devil. They're in his snare. So they have to find their way out of it. Well, to help them find their way out of it, you don't need to be mean and harsh and critical. You need to be gentle and apt to teach and patient. So just some encouragement in that regard. Um, if you have the ability or time or interest to respond to some of these things, uh, some of the comments and help people see the truth, that's a good ministry. And so I just encourage you in that regard. But thanks again for the, the kind thoughts and cards and so on. We appreciate those very much. So what question are we going to take up tonight? Uh, we're going to take up a question that, uh, that came in an email recently. And that question is this, what titles are appropriate for church leaders? So as you think about leaders in the church and ministry and so on, what titles are appropriate? And I'll start simply by saying this. The best practice, in my opinion, is to avoid titles. Uh, things shouldn't be about titles. Um, my suggestion, frankly, is to avoid them. But I want to consider with you three particular examples. And so we're going to look at the title reverend, or the, the word reverend. We'll look at apostle, and we'll look at pastor. And so we're going to pull up our old friend Blue Letter Bible, and we're just going to look at some of these together. So let's start with the word reverend. So we'll run the word reverend and we'll see. Uh, uh, so no video signal, that's a good sign. Let's try this here. Display. So folks, you're seeing it real time. Um, we're going to figure out how to make this work. Just one second here. Here we go. Now, the funny thing about this, I literally set this feature five minutes before starting. So in other words, I got in, I got on, looked, checked it on the computer, set it perfectly, 
It was fine. I don't know what happened in the last five minutes. It decided it wanted to do something else. So that's how it is. We're flexible. We adjust. We adapt. No worries. Okay. We ran the word reverend. You can see that. Now let's look at Psalm 111 verse 9, which is the only place where reverend appears in the scriptures. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Notice, holy and reverend is his name. Have you ever heard someone referred to as the most holy pastor, the most holy high so-and-so? My opinion on that, really what scripture says is, holy and reverend is whose name? His name. It refers to the Lord. So my personal conv- conviction about this is, I don't think you should be refer to yourself as holy. I don't think you should have other people refer to yourself as holy. And I don't think the title reverend is appropriate either. Um, because holy and reverend is his name. It's not my name. So as far as the, the title reverend goes, I don't think it's an appropriate title. I don't, I'm not comfortable with it. I don't think really any man should be using it on the authority of Psalm 111 verse 9. So that's how you think about reverend. You just shouldn't, men shouldn't be using it to refer to themselves or other men. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, what about the term apostle? What about that? What I'm going to run as a search here is I'm going to run A-P-O-S-T-L-E wildcard Paul. And that'll pull up every time that the word apostle and the word Paul are used in the same location. And we'll see how Scripture uh, refers to the Apostle Paul. Now, of course, the best way to do this is you do it by a word search, you know, rather than your memory, because what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to look at at all the instances where it appears. The best searches are always comprehensive. So, as you see here, let's just look at this together. There's 22 hits in 12 verses. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to scroll down through these. And the first thing to notice is, let's see how many times it refers to the capital A Apostle, capital P, Paul. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't. You can see that the words are separated. Romans 1.1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an Apostle. Paul, called to be an Apostle. Paul, 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 an apostle, Paul, an apostle, Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle. Now, you know what's interesting about that? Scripture never calls him the capital A apostle, capital P, Paul. And in fact, it never even capitalizes the word apostle in relation to Paul. I'm going to tell you what that means is that apostle wasn't a title. It wasn't like sir or or duke or earl or, you know, any of those sort of, you think of those honorific titles that exist, it's never capitalized. It's always lowercase. And he's called an apostle, an apostle, an apostle, as if it is simply a role, a, a job, an office that he performs, but it's not a, a title. Look with me. Um, the one that I think the, the verse that I think is probably the most helpful is, let's look at Romans 11.13 together. Look with me at Romans 11.13, and I'm going to just turn to it in the Bible here, and I'll read it to you. But look with me at Romans 11, verse 13. Romans 11.13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle lowercase of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So what is an apostleship? It's an office. It's not really a title. It's an office. It's a role. It's a responsibility that someone holds. So Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, But he never called himself the capital A Apostle. He never referred to himself as capital A Apostle Paul, and nor did anyone else in the Scriptures. Instead, he viewed it as an office. Let's do the same search, but this time let's do it with Peter. Let's just see if Peter handled things similarly or if he handled them 
differently. So we typed in Apostle Wildcard, Peter Wildcard, and we'll look at all the verses that have the word Apostle and the word Peter in the same verse. So we'll let Blue Letter calculate and do its thing, and then we will look at these verses together. So here's what we have. We have seven total verses. Let's go ahead and look at these together. So notice apostles and Peter are separated. Peter and the rest of the apostles. Peter and the other apostles. Now when the apostles, and then Peter's at the end of the verse. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. Peter and apostle. Well, that's just really how Paul used it, isn't it? Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle. So what did we learn from that? When Peter uses the word apostle, it is lowercase every single time. Every single time it's lowercase apostle and it's an apostle, which means that Peter was using it not as a title. It wasn't used as a title referring to Peter, but it was simply a, an office, a responsibility that he held. Now I'm, I'm pondering on this next one, what to do here or not to do. I think I'm going to give you some homework. Are you ready? So here is your homework. Your homework is this. Search the scriptures and tell me how many times the word apostle is capitalized in the scriptures. The two searches that we've just done together is we've looked at Apostle and Paul together, and we looked at Apostle and Peter together, but there are times where the word Apostle is used in a verse and it doesn't have Paul or Peter. There's a bunch of those verses. So your homework is search the word Apostle and then tell me how many times is the word Apostle capitalized anywhere in Scripture. You can post it either on Facebook or you can post it on YouTube either way. But tell me how many times it's used, and once you do that, tell me what conclusion you reach from that research, okay? Now, part of what we're doing with this program is we're, we're trying to show you the tools how to study. So we're studying together some of these things. But it's also important for you to have the skill and have the initiative to go study things for yourself. So I'm going to give you that question about when does Scripture capitalize the word apostle? How many times does it do it? Where does it do it? And what conclusion does it tell you? So share your homework with me. Tell me what you conclude, and we'll see if we conclude the same thing. All right, so we looked at reverend. We looked at apostle. We, we, we saw that reverend is not a term that should be used of men. We saw that the word apostle is not capitalized with regard to Paul or Peter, and it's not a, it's not a title. It's not an honorific. It's an office. It's a responsibility. What that leaves us with is now we need to look at the word pastor. So let's look at the word pastor. So I'm going to type in P-A-S-T-O-R wild card. And what that does is that the wild card is the asterisk. That pulls up both pastor and pastors and any other forms. So it gives us all of them. All right. So we have our results here. Let's look at these together. So we see there that there are there's nine verses. There are nine hits. And let's just go through them one by one. So Jeremiah 17, verse 16. Jeremiah 17, verse 16. As for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest that which came out of my lips was right before thee. So Jeremiah there refers to himself as a pastor. Let's keep reading. And what we're doing as we go through each of these verses, the question we're trying to, to answer is, what does this verse tell me about the word pastor? What does this verse tell me about what pastors do? What does this verse tell me about how to think about pastors scripturally? That's what we're looking for. Jeremiah 2 verse 8, The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Now, the pastors that we're seeing in Jeremiah 2.8 weren't doing a very great job, right? 
the pastors also transgressed against me. So this isn't an example of what a good pastor looks like, but this is an example that pastors sometimes don't do their job very well. Sometimes they transgress against the Lord. So that's, that's an example of what not to do. Jeremiah 3.15, And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Ding, 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 we have a winner. See, does that verse give you some clarity? Doesn't this verse tell you exactly what pastors are supposed to do? Let's read it again. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall, and it's going to tell us what pastors do, feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3.15 is a very clear scriptural explanation of what pastors are supposed to do. They're supposed to feed people, and they're supposed to feed them with knowledge and understanding. The idea is they're supposed to, to teach. So this tells you that the pastoral role is that of a teacher, which means to one of the things that they need to do is they need to be studying. They need to themselves acquire knowledge and understanding from the Word of God so that they can feed the flock, feed the, the saints, the, gr the group, with knowledge and understanding from the Word of God. So the pastoral role is that of a teacher. They are to feed with knowledge and understanding. Let's look at the next hit. Jeremiah 10, 21. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. So let's understand what Jeremiah 10, 21 is telling us. This, again, is a bad example. For the pastors are become brutish. Well, what does brutish mean? What are brutes like? Well, brutes lack wisdom. They lack understanding. They lack knowledge. So a pastor that is brutish is a complete failure as a pastor. They need to have some knowledge and understanding if they're going to feed someone with knowledge and understanding. So the pastors in Jeremiah 10, 21 are not doing a good job. For the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. What that tells you is what a good pastor does is they seek the Lord. And how do they do that? They do that through the study of the word. How do you know the mind of God? Well, you know the mind of God from reading the Word of God. If you want to know God's will for your life, do you close your eyes, lick your finger, put it in the air, and feel which way the wind blows, and then you go in that direction? Well, that would be superstitious. If you want to know the will of God, if you want to know what God would have you to do, if you want to understand what God is doing today, what do you do? You read this book, you study this book, and then you study this book some more, and this book will give you knowledge of the mind of God and of the will of God. That's why it's critical for pastors to seek the Lord. Let's look at the next hit. So Jeremiah 12.10, Many pastors have destroyed my vineyard. They have trodden my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion a desolate wilderness. Now, we've looked at several pastoral verses so far. A lot of these are about pastors not doing their job very well. What that tells you is the pastoral role is not simply about having the title, and it's not really a title. It's not really simply about having that position. It's performing that position scripturally, spending the time to seek the Lord, to have understanding so that you can feed others. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 22. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors, and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. Another example of bad pastors, unfortunately. Jeremiah 23 verse 1 Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. So pastors there are described like shepherds. What are shepherds responsible to do? 
Shepherds are responsible to care for the sheep, to tend to the sheep, to help feed the sheep. What a good shepherd will do is they will take the flock and they'll lead the flock to a place where the, 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 the flock can be fed. So pastors play a role in feeding the flock. Well, this example here in Jeremiah 23, verse 1, these are pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of, of his pasture. So that's not a good thing. Verse 2, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So the pastors that do a poor job of feeding the Lord's flock, is there a recompense for them? According to Jeremiah 23, verse 1 and 2, there is. Now, let me just make a point on verse 2 before we go any further. The pastors that feed my people. Notice that the pastors feed the flock. We've now seen that a couple times. What you've seen from all of these, in every single one of these instances, pastors has never been capitalized, pastor or pastors. Neither of them have been, which tells you it's not a title. It's not an honorific. It's not a thing where you say, well, I, I have the title of pastor. It's, it's not about a title. It's about a responsibility. And the responsibility is to feed people with knowledge and understanding. It's, it's a job, it's a role, it's a responsibility. So let's look at, at the final instance of pastor in the scriptures, Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now, I'm actually, if you would turn there with me, because we need to spend a little bit of time on, on this passage. So Ephesians 4, verse 11. Now, with any verse, you always want to read it carefully. So you want to make sure you understand exactly what it's saying. So let's start in Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave. Now the first thing we're going to notice here is it says gave, which is past tense. It doesn't say, and he is giving. It doesn't say, and he gives. It says, and he gave. So that's a past tense thing. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what purpose? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Now, as you look, as you look at Ephesians 4, verses 11, 12, and 13, that's all part of the same sentence. There's no period in there that cuts it off. And what it starts off saying God gave, it tells you what he gave, and it tells you the purpose for which he gave them, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of the saints. And then it told you how long he gave them. Till we all come in the unity of the knowledge, a unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So here's what that means. When the body of Christ was first started in the middle of the book of Acts, the body of Christ did not have the complete Word of God. Most, much of the Word of God hadn't even been written, right? So Paul hadn't written Ephesians in the middle of the book of Acts. He hadn't written 1 Timothy. He hadn't written 2 Timothy. He hadn't written Titus. He hadn't written Colossians. So how was the body of Christ supposed to function when a bunch of Paul's epistles hadn't even been written? Well, what God did is he gave some offices. He gave some apostles, and he gave some prophets, and he gave some pastors and teachers. What he did is he equipped the body of Christ with, with folks, with people, that could teach the Word of God until the Word of God was complete. Well, what happened by the end of the first century is the Word of God was complete, and because the Word of God was complete, because the Word of God was complete, what that meant was God no longer had to give those apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers. He gave them for a period of time, but when the Word of God was complete, He stopped giving them. So how does that relate 
to pastors. Well, what that tells you is God gave those pastors and teachers for a period of time as special gifts. But when the word of God was complete, he no longer gave them. Now, does the role still exist? Yes, because is there still a need for people to feed the saints with knowledge and understanding? Yes, that there is still a need for that. So are there people that perform a pastoral role? Yes. But are those people gifts from God? Did God supernaturally endue that person with understanding? Well, he didn't do that. See, what happens today is if, if someone sits down to teach, they sit down to preach, what do they have to do? If they're going to help you, if it's going to be profitable, they have to spend time before studying to understand what the Word of God says. If they don't spend any time before studying, and what they do is they just get up and they just talk, well, honestly, that's just a waste of time. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved. You don't just, it doesn't just magically appear in your mind. You have to study the Word of God to get that information. So what this tells us about pastors is, like the other verses that we saw, pastors, it's, it's not a title. It's not something that is capitalized. It's an office. It's a role. It's a responsibility to feed the saints with knowledge and understanding. To do that properly, the pastor needs to get into the Word of God and study it and understand it. Get with me then, Job 32. There's one more passage I want to look at together, and that passage is in the book of Job. So get Job 32. Job chapter 32. And when you get there, let's look at verse 21. Job 32, 21. Let me not, I pray you, Accept any man's person, neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my Maker would soon take me away. What Job 32, verses 21 and 22, indicates is that flattering titles are not a good thing. Now, man's nature is such that man likes flattering titles, and human nature is such that we like to be flattered. And so people often like titles, and it's something that they care about. What does Scripture say about that? Well, Scripture teaches against flattering titles. It says it's not something that you should seek, and it's not something that you should use to call other men. It's, it's not appropriate. So that's why reverend is not a good way to refer to other men. That's why apostle is not really a title. It's more an office, as Romans 11.13 said. And that's why the, the, the term pastor is really a term that describes a responsibility or a role. It's, it's not a, a flattering title. So the best thing to call me is David. That works fine. Some people call me other things. But I like David more than those other things, and um, that seems to me the, the best way to go about this. I mean, if, if we're just being honest about these things, here's, here's the reality of the body of Christ. Everyone in it is a sinner saved by grace, right? Uh, we're told that there is no difference between Jew or Greek in the body of Christ. There's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. The distinction between clergy and laity is a distinction that Scripture would caution you to be very careful about. Every member of the body of Christ uh, is blessed with all spiritual blessings. There aren't some members that get half spiritual blessings and others get all. All of us are blessed with all spiritual blessings. So we shouldn't really think about things according to, to title or, or position or things like that. We should focus on, on holding the head, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might please him in all that we do. 
Well, we appreciate you spending some time studying with us. Do remember, you, you have a homework assignment, and so please do that and post your analysis on Facebook or YouTube, and um, we're curious to see what you conclude. So thanks again for joining with us. Uh, the plan is to be back Thursday night, uh, 7.30 p.m. maybe. Um, we, we may have some things come up. You know, we're in the school year now, and so responsibilities exist. But we look forward to the next time that we can study with you. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is perfect and flawless. We thank you that you've preserved it for us. Help us, Lord, to think about titles and, and, and Lord, really all, all scriptural subjects. Help us to think about them the way that you think about them. Help us to have the view that you have of them. Help us, Lord, to be in your word that we might be instructed by it. We pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.